Traveling and change of scenery is a must. And this year I'm taking my kids back to old country. Old Danube, here we come. We're saying goodbye to internet, Facebook, Instagram, and all the other social media to spend some time with extended family, to reconnect with our roots, and to meet some very cute creatures. For our recipe today, I'm choosing a particular dish which is very traditional to Serbian culture and to the food that's normally produced on Serbian farms. We'll be making a traditional paprikash or pork stew. After taking off from concrete and steel covered Los Angeles, this is quite a change of scenery. Serbian fertile soil offered all sorts of tapestry of different grains. In recent years, the former Yugoslavian nation has broken the top 10 in terms of largest exported corn volumes by country. I'm very excited to take you to our family farm to show you what the typical Serbian farm looks like. That was an exhausting flight and it was almost the night time when we reached our village. Mornings are definitely different around here. Auntie Biljana is up early this morning with a big grin on her face. Oh, and by the way, the nearest Starbucks store is about 120 kilometers away. On Jovanovic farm, animals are taken care of first and then we might have a chance to have our coffee. While my sister and I pursued our careers outside the family farm life, my brother decided to stay, and we are all so glad he did. Today, he's one of the leading and the most modern farmers in its region. He has always been a big softie when it comes to animals, and to this day, he says that this is his happiest time in a day. He loves taking care of its cattle. During the war 30 years ago, he would come back home from the front with the pockets filled of misplaced and lost puppies and kittens. Any animal would be very lucky to be under his care. Okay, um, it's hard to resist and not to go and pet the babies. So I'm gonna go and give them some love. <laughs> hey, baby. Hey, baby. These were only a few days old. Did you guys know that cows can actually make great pets? The only trouble is, they are just so big and they need a lot of space. Brand new. It was born just a few days ago. It's absolutely beautiful. Are you hungry? Huh? Are you hungry? They're so well taken care of. This one is a little bit older and it's kind of staying away. Yeah. One is really shy, the other one is all. Bring it on.
While most farms raise beef, very few still have sheep. And the only reason our family farm still does is because of my mother. She just refuses to give them up. Unlike cows and pigs, sheep is kept more for decoration and for the tradition. I mean, what kind of farm is it if you don't have sheep on it, right? Joking aside, I think it's just a matter of time before my brother and my sister-in-law decide not to keep them anymore. However, as long as the grandma is still alive, they too will be around. And since we are talking about sheep, during old times, most households kept sheep not only for wool, but also for milk and meat. There were also other reasons. Sheep manure. Like other animal manures, sheep manure is a natural slow-release fertilizer. Nutrients in sheep manure fertilizer provide adequate nourishment for garden and for grass. So if you want to grow lush green fields, this manure is high in both phosphorus and potassium, which are essential elements for optimal plant growth. Sheep also provide no pesticide weed control, because not only do they eat grass, they also eat weeds. While on our farm, sheep are not getting all the credit they deserve, worldwide, sheep are becoming more and more popular, and rightfully so. Our beautiful fruit orchard is a great testimony to some of the benefits of owning the sheep. They keep the grass and weeds perfectly mowed while fertilizing the soil so that we can enjoy fresh fruit each year. A farm would not be a farm without its piglets. It's the beginning of June and Mama Piggy just had her babies. For now, together with their mom, they're spending time in a nursery. Nurseries offering safety to the piglets and a clean environment for Mother Piggy to rest and nurse her babies. Most of the day is spent eating, nursing and sleeping. Baby pigs generally nurse anywhere between 20 to 30 days. The rest of the time is spent sleeping and exploring whenever they get the chance. After nursing period, piglets are separated from the mother to be fed solid food. Did you know that pigs will grow from a birth weight of 4 pounds to a finishing weight of 250 pounds in five and a half months? It is at this age that a piglet is considered to be mature and fully grown. These little piggies are still considered teenagers and will stay in enclosure until they grow to their full size so they can move outside with the rest of the pigs. Full grown pigs are promoted to a spa like mud bats. This is what you call a good life because pigs love mud. Since horses are no longer used to work the land, cows are now most important animal on the farm. At age of 10 years old, I used to milk four cows and I had a little tune to help me go through the milking process. It goes something like this. Tunis Morocco, Addis Abeba, Tungaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregaregarega
which my sister Bidana is growing to refresh her current chicken stock. Fresh meat, eggs, and dairy is just the beginning on our menu. To enhance dishes with these basic ingredients, each year, vast gardens are planted. In our family, it's common to dedicate acres and acres of land to gardens alone. Our region is known for its cabbage, but my sister-in-law and my mom grow all sorts of vegetables which are, after summertime, used for canning. To this day, most gardening is done by hand. However, when it comes to raising bigger crop, these toys come to play. That was not always the case. I remember working these exact fields by hand with my brother and sister. In fact, most of their summer breaks were spent working these endless fields. But like everything else, this has changed too. Today, our family farm is running and is equipped with all the modern machinery. And because of that, my nephew's life is quite different than my brother's, my sister's and mine was. You can drive for miles and not see a single person working in fields. Today's tour would not be complete if I didn't introduce you to the most important piece of equipment on our farm. This is our late father's tractor. This old boy is over 50 years old and to this day it's still running thanks to my brother's care. Every so often, my brother will bring it out of its semi-retirement just to show the bigger boys who the true boss is. The new players will have to put a lot more dirt under their tires before they start to enjoy the same status. That was a quick tour of our family farm and now let's focus on our recipe. As mentioned in the beginning, we are focusing on ingredients which are raised on this farm and on a dish that's traditionally Serbian. After all that work on the farm, I, I think the most appropriate recipe would be something that is traditional and something that contains all the ingredients that you could grow in a place like my brother's farm. So I'm gonna make a traditional Serbian dish called paprikash. Paprikash is very similar to stew, except this will be a little bit thinner. A home smoked bacon makes everything better. So this is item that you can find on most of the farms in Serbia. Uh, this is a typical piece of bacon that we'll just use just a little bit of it for flavoring. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna cut it in small pieces and we're gonna fry this first to get some of that smoky flavor and some of that good aroma before we add onions and other ingredients. There's a much study to show that bacon is not that bad for us after all. Uh, the key is to have a, a healthy animal who is allowed to spend some time outside, especially on the sun for the vitamin D, and also uh, it's an animal that's fed a good food or good feed. So this is something that my brother is still able to do. He grows his own corn, his own wheat, so he can feed his animals well. And as you saw uh, in the video, they're also allowed to wander outside. So we'll start with uh, pre-cooking the bacon. You can obviously add more if you wish. And I'm also going to add about the one quarter cup of olive oil. Let's just fry for a little bit. I'm going with a half a head of a large onion. So we're just going to cut it in a small pieces because uh, I like onions uh, when they are cooked so well that they basically melt inside the dish. You cook the bacon because sometimes bacon might contain extra moisture and uh, the temperature is very hot, that can kind of explode and it can um, go to your eyes. So be careful. 
once the bacon is nice and brown, we're going to add onion. While onions and bacon are cooking, I'm going to move to celery. Also going to add celery right away so that onions and celery can cook simultaneously. A stew or paprikash can be made with chicken, beef, or with pork. And since we, um, we have a lot of pork in our region, I decided to go ahead and use pork. But um, I think one of my favorite paprikashes are chick is actually chicken paprikash. So as you see, I'm just cutting it into small pieces and this is a boneless pork tenderloin. Pieces like this where you have um, extra fat and veins, you can cut out and uh, leave it out of the dish. Or uh, as I'm doing, I'm gonna use it all because uh, uh, in old times, meat was not wasted and these pe uh, pieces, when well cooked, they were just as delicious as the rest of the meat. Now that the onions and celery are halfway cooked, I'm gonna add meat. Ideally, you have the temperature on medium high, and this depends on your stove. This particular stove is a little bit slower than my stove down downstairs, so I'm keeping it on high, and I'm still not getting that perfect temperature. But um, at this stage of cooking, you do want vegetables and meat to sizzle. And now that we have meat in, I'm gonna add a little bit more of olive oil and then I'm going to cover it. Now, when covering, um, obviously I want to uh, create even higher, uh, and hotter temperature inside, but I don't want to keep all the moisture in. So I'm just going to cover it like this so that extra moisture can escape so the meat is actually frying for a little bit. Okay, this is, now it's a good time to peel the garlic. If you don't already have some garlic peel, uh, normally what I do to my, uh, my schedule ahead, if you will. Uh, very often when kids are not doing anything, I will soak up some of the garlic cloves in the water because that helps when you peel the garlic. And then I will have kids peel the garlic while they watch TV or they even you know, sit around and don't do anything. So uh, right now, as you can see, I gotta do it myself, but that's just a little tip to keep your kids busy and engaged in a kitchen with you. While onions are simmering, I want to show you another old and very special part of our farm. This is old wooden storage house. Generally, they were used to store different grains, flour, lard, uh, or if you had olive oil, uh, all the stuff that you would make during the fall, like the canning goods, and of course, moonshine. This is some of my mom's private stock. This building was transported from its original place, piece by piece, by my brother. Every piece of wood was marked and transferred to its new location. This old building is like a treasure box. Biljana and I are going to take a look through a memory lane of our great-grandmothers. She pulled out this wooden dish, which is called nachve, and normally the bread dough was made in this particular dish. And you can only imagine how much bread was baked daily. Buildings like this one are part of the past. I'm so thankful he did because I spent my entire childhood in this exact attic doing live theater for the children in our neighborhood. It's time to clean up and to grab some refreshments. One of our favorite things in the world is a homemade elderberry juice. So when we're in the States, my daughter loves going to a Barron's Market and she likes to buy these English uh, elderberry sodas. They're extremely expensive. So when we were thinking about coming here, she could not wait to come home because she knows the best elderberry juice is right here. Her auntie makes it. So now it's perfect time for refreshment. 
Elderberry grows abundantly in Serbia and it blooms in June and we were just lucky enough to be there at the right time. Everybody's busy making elderberry juice, so entire village is filled with elderberry fragrance. Elderberry grows near the forests and fields. Before we pick ours, we're going to make a quick stop to my sister's miniature home. Picking fresh elderberry flowers, or as we call it, zova, is a great activity for young people. This is a great chance to reconnect with friends and with the nature, not to mention to be separated for a little bit from their devices. Oh, By now, you must know how passionate I am about getting kids out in the nature. I wish we had time to show you how elderberry juice is made. I will make sure the next time we visit, we capture the process, the recipe, and we show you how this is done. Okay, adding some freshly cut peppermint is optional. And um, if I was back home, I would add a little bit of lemon too, but um, perhaps it is better not to spoil the true elderberry flavor. So only thing that's missing is ice and some fresh water. So I'm gonna go and get some water from the well. This water is coming straight from the ground. It's very cold and crisp. While we're talking about elderberry flower, I would encourage you to grab your phone. Like right now, I'm quite sure you have it right next to you somewhere. And go and Google health benefits of elderberry flowers. I'm sure you will be quite amazed. You'll find out that no drink company can outdo what nature does. And there you have it. So cheers to the nature. As you can see, I'm cutting my cubes rather small. And again, that's because I like when potatoes almost melt completely in my stew. But if you like a little heartier uh, look and uh, taste, uh, you can cut them much bigger. Just make sure that they're thoroughly cooked before they are served. I'm adding a tablespoon of a chicken stock. Beef would be great too. And I'm going to add all this garlic. With garlic, you can go much lighter, but I am a big garlic fan, so I always add a little extra. So I'm going to let this simmer for just about a minute. The garlic releases its flavors, and then I'm going to add the potatoes. Next is about a teaspoon of sweet Hungarian paprika. Black pepper for taste. And finally, potatoes. Add potatoes, you're going to need a little bit more of olive oil because potatoes will absorb a lot of fat and a lot of moisture from a dish. So we're going to let this simmer for maybe about 10 minutes before we add other ingredients and then reduce the temperature and let it simmer for another 20 to 30 minutes slowly so that all the ingredients and all the flavors come together nicely. Once potatoes are in, you have to kind of watch the dish because the potatoes have tendency to burn the bottom. So you have to stir it often and at some point we will have to add a little bit of moisture. We will be adding um, a chicken broth in my case, but beef broth would be good as well. So again, once you have potatoes in, watch out. Potatoes will cook for about 15, maybe 20 minutes, depending on the type of potato you use. And while they cook, we're going to take a quick break and have a slice of a melon. This is looking really good. I let the potatoes cook for a little bit so they can form this beautiful brown crust. It's, it's going to add wonderful flavor to the paprika. Okay, I'm just going to mix it and let it cook again to get a little bit more of these brown spots on my potatoes and on my meat. I wish you guys could smell this. It, the whole house smells wonderful. And as you can see, 
we got a, a lot of these uh, caramelized pieces in the stew and now we're going to move on and we're going to add a little bit of broth. Now the key here is to add just a little broth at the time. Okay, and I'm going to let this simmer. So the key here is to continue to cook the, the potatoes and meat and to soften it and we will come back every four or five minutes to add a little bit more moisture until all the ingredients are nice and soft and then we're going to add the rest of the broth and the rest of the vegetables. But for now, we're looking good and I'm just going to let it simmer and this time I'm going to close the lid. While paprikash is simmering, I'm going to pre-cut some fresh parsley. Every three to five minutes, check and make sure that the dish is not burning on the bottom and add little extra of the broth. I would suggest to keep it on medium to medium low fire. Now we're cooking the rest of the broth and I'm going to cook it about a cup and a half of water. Okay, nice and thin about the right consistency of uh, paprikash, at least the consistency that I like. It's time to add peas. My mom is now about 82 years old, so one of her jobs is to, um, you know, open up each pea pod and get the peas out. So she loves doing stuff like that. She's also very good at cleaning walnuts. Tomatoes are optional. This is just for the color. But fresh parsley is an absolute must. As for pepper, I'm not gonna open it or cut it. Uh, I'm gonna keep it intact because I will um, add this pepper to the dish only for about maybe five minutes, just to get a little bit of fresh pepper flavor. I'm ready to turn the fire off. And now we're just gonna add that pepper. So this is my favorite way to make paprikash. Obviously, there are many different ways in recipes, so for all of you out there, especially Slavic people who like to make paprikashes and stews, if this recipe is not how you do it, apologies in advance. This is my version and uh, this is how my mom used to make it. The recipe is super simple, it's easy and quick to make, and it's very nutritious for you and your kids. In times when there's so much processed and fast food around us, it gives me a great pleasure to revive these old recipes, which are not only hearty and healthy, but also very comforting. I like to entertain the notion that we all will start eating more foods that we produce ourselves. Rather they come from the patio pot or from the large farm, I think we all should embrace the new that is the old culture of eating. Thank you so much for spending time with us today and for watching our program. My name is Vlada Vladik and I'm a founder of a charitable organization called Vlada Seeds of Life, whose mission is reconnecting families and communities. To find out more about my charity and its work, please visit vladav.com.